Okay. Click the path here. All right. Hopefully it'll do everything I want it to do. Turn your phone off. Uh, let's see. Oh. Hold on just a second, don't need me. Okay, I want to slideshow presenter view. Here, okay. Did I unmute? Ask them if they can hear you. Roseanne, can you hear me? I hear you, Sharon. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Neil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gee, we're so excited. We didn't think anyone would come. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you again. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's been a long time. I'm actually at work, so I'm about to close it down. So I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. Hello. I have lost my audio. You've lost your audio. Do you want me to take over the meeting? <laughs> you might have to close and hear my audio. Okay. So, um, I can't hear myself or hear anybody. So you can feel free to start at any time when you can. So I'll just try to get my audio. Okay. Do you want me to stay on the phone with you? Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, it's so fun to be back with you folks. We're trying to decide whether this is really going to be uh, something that our TACTA members would, would like to do, but um, Roseanne's having a little trouble getting on with her audio. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah, you're um, coming in fine. All right, thanks, Gary. All right, so um, she has, Roseanne has asked me this month to do um, a preparedness guide, a family and individual preparedness guide. And um, I presented this a number of times in the past uh, years to groups, and we've had it functioning quite well in various neighborhoods and um, have had a lot of fun with the experience, but um, I think I'll just go ahead and start. Is it, um, I, I don't see the time, but it looks like we're, we're right on time and, and uh, we can go ahead and start if that's okay with you folks. All right. Sure. Um, the uh, emergency plan, uh, we're hoping to be able to uh, prepare our friends and our family and take the plan to an actual neighborhood level. And hopefully this will give us an additional level of security and preparation for our people. But it just seems like the greatest threat to our preparedness, one of the great threats to our own preparedness is, is having neighbors, family, friends, extended family prepared as well. And so that's why we have developed this plan. And uh, we want to be able through this plan to uh, in an emergency in our own neighborhoods to be able to uh, report to the emergency management people, whether it's ambulance, police, uh, fire department or whatever emergency management that we need to contact. We want to be able to report for a group, the location, the description of the emergency and how how we can be reached, uh, the names of the injured missing and the next of kin, the description of the property damage, the actions being taken by us and the assistance that we need. And we thought if we could be able to do this for a group because so many of them wouldn't have communication capability. So if we thought, we thought if we had someone dedicated or uh, uh, 
uh, someone assigned in a neighborhood to be able to do this, it would greatly facilitate the response to our emergencies. So in getting started, we asked our folks to make a neighborhood map. And uh, in my neighborhood, I had about 12, about 12 uh, homes that I thought might work well together. And we had some natural boundaries that, uh, that kind of a voting district boundary and people that we already knew fairly well. And then I went and visited each one of those neighbors and I told them about my concerns for being prepared and the objectives of the plan and asked them if they wouldn't like to meet. So I set a date for the meeting and surprisingly, a lot of people showed up. <laughs> and so um, the objectives of the neighborhood plan, I wanted to tell them, we want to teach the preparedness concepts. We want to get to know our neighbors and really important, we wanted to pool our resources and then offer the help and expertise of all of our neighbors in various subjects and so that we could help one another. And um, we want to be able to account for the condition of the members and provide temporary relief if possible and fortify their spiritual, emotional and spiritual strength. So that's quite a, quite a handful of things that we would like to do with this emergency plan, but I think we can. So during the meeting, I, pulled, I called the meeting and uh, we voted for a chairman and a secretary. And I thought it was important that I didn't become the chairman and the secretary. I wanted to involve other people in responsibility and ask them to give their contact information to everyone in the meeting. And then I distributed a copy of this neighborhood plan, which will be available to you on our TACTA website. And I gave each one of them a copy. And then I asked them to make a list of the skills that they had in the group and see if they would be willing to, to share their skills and the resources that they might be willing to share, such as uh, I, I, my husband had a tractor and he had a big truck and, and another uh, member said, well, I have a chainsaw. If there was something that uh, in a windstorm, if I, we had to come and remove things, I, I can do it with a chainsaw. And so there were, a, everyone it seemed had something that they could share. And uh, then we asked them if they wanted to list a family contact. So in the event that they weren't at home and they had neighborhood, they had damage to their home or property, or if they were hurt, if they would share with us a family contact. And then we took that list, the secretary was to take that list and put the list someplace safe, such as in a refrigerator or a freezer. And those are actually the safest places I could come up with in our, in our group. And um, then I said, let's, let's start by listing the emergency. So I would like each of you to take your mute off. And so we're gonna pretend like we're in a meeting. And so first thing we're gonna do is list our emergencies. And these are some of the things that I came up with. So power outage to me is huge. Uh, in, in our neighborhood where we were doing it, we uh, were kind of low and we had low river and flooding was always a uh, concern, earthquake, um, hazardous material accidents actually occurred in our neighborhood. It was quite an incident. And uh, we had a terrorist, uh, we had listed terrorist attack as a possibility. <laughs> and, <laughs> there's Roseanne. <laughs> Hi, Roseanne. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. We figured it out. Civil unrest, uh, communication failures, sickness and injuries, death of a spouse or other family member. Can you think of anything else, any of you? Because you're well, we all in a, now. <laughs> we just had a, a power outage uh, this, this week. Uh, we had a flash flooding that uh, and torrential rains that uh, flooded homes, killed three people in our state. Oh um, my gosh. Wow. And where, where are you located? This is Peter in Alabama. Oh, Alabama, Peter. Wow. You, you are always so prepared, Peter. I was, and I'm thrilled that you were able to, to uh, help with that emergency. Any other emergencies you can think of? Winter okay, storms no. and ass storms. Volcanic eruption. Winter storms, right. What else? Volcanic eruption. Volcanic, absolutely. So there's, and each of your neighborhoods are going to have their own individual concerns 
And so first of all, I thought if we just listed them and just kind of made them start thinking about them. So then I went through these things one by one. And I said, well, what, what are some of the causes of a power outage? Because that's big to me. It's, it's one, I mean, most of the emergencies will result in power outage. Uh, Peter, did yours result in a power outage? It did. Um, you know, I had uh, two nervous daughters. Um, but fortunately, I, had, I knew where my chem lights were. And, you know, with a three-year-old and seven-year-old, they're fun to play with and they give them some light. So they're not so scared. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I gave my wife one and I just said, uh, you know, if I, I'd use hers if I needed it. Um, so, you know, we were okay where we were, uh, but there was a lot of heavy flooding. Um, and like I said, uh, some folks were killed. Um, wow. One, one uh, couple, young couple, uh, they, the, the boy actually graduated from the same high school I did, but he was much younger. Oh, uh, he and his girlfriend were swept, their car was swept off a uh, uh, road. Yeah, and that was a bad one. But, uh, and then not long before that, uh, back on Passover, actually, we had a, a tornado blow right over our house. And uh, um, we managed that one, but uh, I was in communication with uh, ham radio operators, uh, part of Aries. The Shelby County Aries. So uh, uh, I got out after it passed and you know, was reporting damage back. And uh, fortunately, there wasn't much, but uh, I've certainly seen the communications plan and process. You have. That's amazing. Maybe you want to think about moving. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Uh, Roseanne, did you send your uh, invitation to your sister, Julie? I she did. Wanted... Okay. I'll remind so, her. All right. So, um, so we certainly could have power surges around brownouts. Uh, lightning is a big one, wildfires, flood, like Peter has just experienced, um, winds and tornadoes, that could, that could go on for days to months in, in high winds. Severe earthquake, we could lose power for weeks to months, terrorist attack, and coronal mass ejection. Do you all know what a coronal mass ejection is? And so um, all of these things are- Solar flare. Yeah, thank you. And so all of these things are, are certainly uh, threats to, to our power. So um, what are the effects of that? Well, we may not have running water and um, uh, most likely won't. Uh, the failure of our sewage system and some of the cities maybe have uh, a, a gravity fed sewer system, but most of, most of them require a, a lot of um, pumps and in the long term they won't have enough fuel to run their generators to keep that going so we often see sewage back backups in our cities when we have these emergencies no open stores i mean everything i mean how many times a week do i go to the store i hate to even admit uh, no emergency response from the police and fire and ambulance and no communications so can you think of any other effects of power outage? I, I can. Um, there's a feedback loop with the nuclear power plants. So if there was an EMP and the electrical grid went down, then you run into an issue with the 100 nuclear power plants in the United States um, not having problems cooling the reactors after, let's say, 30 days. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's huge. Shortages so, on loss of refrigeration and freezing. Yes, yes. And in that event, and we want to encourage them uh, to eat out of their uh, refrigerator first and then out of their freezer and then out of their pantry if possible. So food storage, we, we certainly want to um, encourage them to uh, look at short-term as well as long-term foods and uh, people think if they have a, many times they think if they have a month's supply of, of food that that's enough, but it certainly isn't. And uh, I'm sure you all, most all of you know, Paul Seyfried, my business partner, and he likes to say, we all have enough food and water to last us the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I guess that's true. If I only had a two or three days supply of water, then my lifespan is about a week. I have enough to last until the rest of my life. 
<laughs> most people don't think of that in those terms. So we do, we all have everything we need for the rest of our lives. Uh, thinking about food preparation. Um, uh, uh, some of us have some nice little propane heaters that we can temporarily cook with, alcohol stoves, solar ovens, coal and wood stoves, charcoal, outside only, of course. But um, any of you have any good ideas about food preparation for loss of and when you ha don't have power? Uh, don't forget about fireless cookers, the idea of uh, heating, using a, a small amount of fuel to heat something to boiling and then remove it from the source and put it in a highly insulated box. Where oh, I love it. Cooking. I just love that. That would be a great class, wouldn't it? Uh, that'd be a really nice class to offer. And then our sanitation issues. And so people need to kind of understand the difference between rubbish and garbage and uh, how to dispose of human waste. And so that's something that we could we could uh, certainly talk to our people about, but rubbish, paper, metal, and things like that. Paper can be burned and glass and metal probably ought to be separated. But garbage uh, in food and animal products, we need to be able to separate those and teach them to, uh, to dig a hole and be able to prepare that uh, so that they, they aren't uh, going to be uh, having a, a lot of the problems of, of disease. And, um, then we don't have any medical, if we don't have medical or uh, police response, then uh, it might be nice to offer classes in CPR and first aid and how to build a good first aid kit and uh, keep a good supply of over-the-counter medicines. So these are things that we could encourage in our, in our meeting. And water storage and, and um, uh, because um, several of our people in our neighborhood had trucks, uh, they offered to take um, orders for those big 55 gallon barrels and then they went down and got them and then distributed them to the people. I now live in a, a branch in St. George and the average age of our branch is 81. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to do a lot to help one another. But uh, the water storage is such a huge issue, and we need to tell them how to prepare those barrels for water storage, how to, to uh, clean them and, and uh, sanitize them first before they put the water in and teach them how to set this barrel where it's going to be for the long term life of that barrel, because we're not going to be moving it once it's full of water and, and what kind of a hose to use to fill it and to dedicate a hose to that purpose, one of those white food grade uh, water hoses that that uh, you can buy at the uh, uh, camping stores, and uh, and then for um, storage the water that needs that go below uh, below and and beyond that storage capacity, we need to teach them how to clarify their water and how to purify it and the methods that we have for doing that. But I think water really is our limiting factor. There's a lot we can do with. Uh, every other emergency, but water is such a limiting factor for us. So it probably would be well to give some good classes on water purification. Communications is, is really important too. Our AM radios, um, you would think that um, that wouldn't be such a great source, but AM radios, if, if, uh, if they're battery fed, then we it, in a large scale communication failure, like all over the United States, nobody is transmitting and we can hear, uh, we can receive uh, AM radio clear across the oceans to, to Europe. We can hear what's going on. So it's very important that we know what's going on in these emergencies, what the, the possible cause of the emergency, how long it's gonna last, what kind of things they're being done to, to help it. And uh, CB and family radios are so important in our in our neighborhoods. And so I would I encourage our neighborhood for everyone to get a little uh, walkie talkie. And so we we dedicated a, a, a frequency on our walkie talkie that we could all reach one another. And then I'm also an amateur radio operator. And in those days I had a nice station so I could reach out on my amateur radio if we do the 40 to 80 meter um, radio because that one doesn't need a repeater and I could reach out and find what was going on a very long ways and then I could send that information out to my 
uh, ham radio, or to my uh, uh, family radios, to our walkie talkies. And we were able to set up a communication line, line of sight for a long ways. We had all across, almost all across our state, we had walkie talkies that would repeat our messages and we exercised that and it was really fun to do. And um, so we want to be able to, to uh, use radios wherever we can. When we don't have the radio, I thought how important it would be to leave a note for rescuers or so if someone comes uh, and a, a family member comes and they see our house is falling down, are we going to be able to, uh, uh, you know, will they go in looking for us and risking their own lives through all of that rubble or have we dedicated a note keeping place outside in kind of a safe place where they could look for a note to see if we've left a note, we've gone to so and so, we're, we're at the neighborhood church or wherever we are. And so they're not going into a building that's been damaged and looking for us. And the help and okay signs for our windows, I think are extremely important. So in that first meeting, we had um, printed out our help and okay signs and, and uh, put a nice plastic cover on it and told them if they needed help to put it in their window or if they were okay to put that in their window so we didn't have to be going to every home. And um, then we talked about alternative power systems. And um, so um, a lot of our people had uh, generators and uh, solar panels and, and solar panels are, are great if they're connected to a battery, but the solar panels they're selling now, of course, they're connected to the grid and a lot of people don't have backup batteries, but I just bought a, a nice little, um, um, generator, a solar generator, and I can use that not for big things, but I could run quite a few things on that little solar generator and my, my battery and it has an inverter so I can use AC on it as well. And uh, uh, it'd be nice to keep a little deep cycle battery or some kind of a battery so you could run some some uh, low amperage lights in your home because your, your, your flashlights are going to be extremely important to you. And if you have low amperage lights, it would be very nice to be able to have a battery system. You could uh, pull that up. Um, Sharon, can I ask a question? Sure. If your solar hookup with your batteries, what size inverter do you have? Well, I only had a um, 500 watt gener uh, solar panel. And so that solar panel went to a generator that already had a built-in inverter. Oh, okay, thank you. And so that was a neat little system. Uh, and I keep that battery charged all the time so that I could recharge it with my solar panel. I also have a little uh, 2KW gasoline generator and I keep gasoline in my garage at all times, but I don't store it in the plastic containers. I store it in metal containers because they don't off gas like the plastic and we're real hot here in St. George. So I went and got uh, to Ace Hardware always has them, those jerry cans that are the red metal containers. So I always keep two of those full uh, in case I needed them for the generator or if I needed to top off my car. So um, I'm sure some of you will have other ideas about alternative uh, energy systems and, and uh, uh, it's really nice to be able to have a little build-in power someplace <laughs> to get us through an emergency. We have a kind of a, a we have a, a, a farm in Utah that we would all go to in an event of an emergency and we have quite a nice solar system there. So we're all off grid, but getting to that farm is going to be the challenge. So we're hoping that in an EMP that our cars will still function and we'll be able to get there. So I encourage them to look at a risk assessment as, as a true risk assessment, as probability and con versus uh, times consequence. So a lot of times people will say, well, the probability is that uh, so low, I'm not going to worry about it. Or they could, uh, will look at it and say, well, there's hardly any probability. But if, if there's a consequence of death or severe injury, no matter how low the probability is, unless it's zero, then it's still a high risk assessment because we have to multiply that probability times that huge consequence of losing our life or being injured. So don't let them bypass 
issues that they think are not important if the consequence is huge and results in, in, uh, in death or, or severe injury. So everybody needs to, to think through those in that process of probability and consequence. So um, during that meeting, I asked um, one family to familiarize themselves with the gas turn off and the water turn off in each of the units, in each of the homes, and then to keep a tool that would turn off that gas or that water if they had to. I remember one day a neighbor came frantically to my house and, and her house was flooding and she had no idea how to turn off her water. And so we had to go find and turn off her water for her and uh, ask if there's someone that would be willing to, to do a quick damage and injury survey of the neighborhood so that one person uh, and of course, we're all going to be looking at that individually, but that one person will come back and report. Now, this person has, has been injured and they need some help. And this person's house has a tree fallen on it or whatever it is. But to, to be aware and have someone that's capable to be able to do that. Um, and of course, hopefully they have a walkie talkie and they can uh, communicate with us. And uh, suggest a neighborhood watch program. Um, I just bought the... Um, um, the ring program. And so I have some nice uh, cameras and, and the ring program. And I was looking the other day and for three nights running, I had some car come slowly through the neighborhood at about 3.30 in the morning. And I thought, well, we need to be watching for that car, watching and see why they're there. But uh, a neighborhood watch program, especially in times of, of uh, 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 problems, we, we need to be able to watch our neighborhoods. And then of course, to challenge each person to keep their tanks at least half full of gas. And uh, there's a few things that I'm perfect in and that's one of them. I never let my gas tank go below half full. And <clears throat> with that half full and with my extra gasoline in the garage, I can uh, pretty well get where I need to go. But uh, there's a lot of things that would require us to immediately evacuate. Uh, one day we were in that neighborhood and uh, um, all of a sudden, I mean, it was early morning and I thankfully was at least dressed, but I heard bull horns and sirens and the fire department racing through our little, our, it was, wasn't a big neighborhood and, and uh, police running door to door, evacuate, evacuate now. And so I grabbed the kids and threw them in the car and I always had a little emergency kit in the car. I had diapers and things and left immediately, but there had been a leak in the, um, of uh, chlorine in our neighbor in our uh, in our park uh, swimming pool, and that cloud was headed towards our neighborhood. So you never know how quickly you might have to evacuate. So when we're talking about seventy two hour kits and preparation kits, encourage them to leave them someplace where they can grab them quickly, and hopefully to have something in their car as well. But we always kept ours in an outside in a closet that was near an exit door so that we could go quickly. You might remember when uh, FCDA put out a pamphlet called Four Wheels to Survival. And during the Cold War, they urged everybody to keep their car mechanically sound, their tires good, and never ever let your tank go below one half. Well, here in South Carolina, uh, we suffered under that um, Colonial pipeline shut down. Fortunately, I had a half a tank and I refill when I'm at three quarters of the tank. And it saved us from having any problems at all. But 76% of the gasoline stations in South Carolina ran out of fuel. Wow. It got even worse when you got further east of, uh, of South Carolina. Oh, that's amazing. And, and it's so vulnerable. We're so vulnerable to that with our technology now, but that's very interesting. I'm glad you were prepared. Um, then uh, suggest to the, them that they have, a, that they do an outside gathering place. And I know we used to do these exercises all the time for fire, but if there's a fire and you have a large family, a lot, lot of people in the house, or if you have visitors in the house, be sure to tell them, this is where we go. If there's a fire and we have to evacuate our home, this is where we meet so that everyone goes and we're not looking for people in the dark and we're not going back into a home to look for people. 
And uh, be sure to list the handicapped in your neighborhood and the elderly and the widows and anyone that might need some extra help and, and make sure that they're assigned to a, a very uh, a, a assigned to a family that will be able to uh, look after them. And include the children in your plans and your assignments. We always had, um, uh, we'd ask the kids to uh, say, now, will you be a babysitter for the younger kids? And will you be prepared to read them some stories and play some games or whatever uh, they might uh, like to participate in? Or, or will you uh, uh, just uh, use them and assign them and help them so that they're part of the emergency plans because they feel secure if they are. And um, uh, we listed all the children in our neighborhood and uh, put them physically on a list. We didn't send it by computer. We physically put every child on a list with the parent's name and signature, and then assigned three people in our neighborhood that would be able to go to school and pick up those children. And then we gave that list to the principal. We didn't said, please don't rely on your computers for this list, but if there's a problem, we want to be able to come and pick up these children. And all of these parents have agreed that this parent shall be able to pick up this number of children. And we did have an emergency where one of the neighbors had to go and gather our children and bring them home so that we were able to stay and deal with that emergency. So, um, and then talk about evacuation routes. I mean, there are some things, a lot of times, uh, as staying where we are and, and uh, sheltering at home is the best uh, option, but sometimes we do have to evacuate and we want to make sure that people understand and know and have routed evacuation routes. I was, um, I was stopped, uh, go on my way to uh, Salt Lake from St. George, uh, I'd gone all the way to Nephi, which is just, it takes me four hours, four and a half hours to get from St. George to Salt Lake. And I was within just a little over an hour of Salt Lake. So I'd gone three hours <laughs> already and we were stopped on the freeway and there were no off-roads. And had I had a good atlas, I could have found another route, but they turned us around. And when I saw the number of people that were going the route they suggested and all of the trucks, and I knew it was a two lane highway, I decided to go back home. So I turned around and went the other three hours, went three hours again, went back home and started again the next morning. But had I had that Atlas, I would have been able to find a route. And now I, I, I just sent for that atlas, a good road atlas, and keep it in my car at all times so that I know what these routes are. And, uh, and, and it, it would be good to, to, even neighborhood routes would be really good to map. So create a plan, whether we're going to shelter in place or we're going to evacuate, and, uh, and then, then list that plan. Um, so the potential classes that we talked about, and Roseanne, how much time do I have? Am I running out? You have, well, you, we have till seven, but if you wanna you know, have questions at the end, then you, you still have like 20 minutes or 15, 20. Okay, cause I'm, I, I'm getting close, but um, okay. a great uh, class is 72 hour kits. And uh, it's, um, it's something that, it isn't something you just do and then put away because <laughs> come fall and come winter, my summer 72 hour kit doesn't, doesn't work. And so this is something when we're, if we're meeting regularly with this neighborhood group, we might uh, encourage them each change of season to look at that 72 hour kit and, and uh, change it and freshen the water and, and change the things that need to be changed for another season. And our food storage, uh, people a lot of times just don't understand what food storage is and all of our TACTA members, you all understand this, but uh, food storage to so many people is a, a total mystery and uh, that's something that, that we need to talk about. Water storage and sanitation, that can be two or three classes and um, we're offering these classes now in our um, in our neighborhood area here where we have such a lot of elderly people, they have asked us now to take our neighborhood and go to the HOA level. And so we'll have a very large number of people that we can call from. And I'm hoping that they're going to be starting this. A few of them have started, but, um, but I'm going to be pushing this now. And then we'll offer these classes through our neighborhood 
uh, we have a nice uh, uh, clubhouse in our subdivision <clears throat> and we'll offer these classes and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll not have to teach all of the classes, but, but to encourage those within your group that have so many skills, the nurses, the engineers, the contractors, all of those people have so many skills and encourage them to, to uh, get classes and teach one another. Um, CPR and first aid. Um, uh, CPR changes, the requirements change quite rapidly. I ran on the ambulance for several years, about four years in, uh, when I was younger. And, and, uh, and of course we always had to keep up our CPR, but CPR is not the same now as it was then. So um, we're, we're doing CPR differently. First aid, uh, there is still the basics of first aid, but, but uh, it's really nice to review these things with the folks because there's so much, so much can be done just uh, it, within a family home if, they're, if they have the confidence to do it. And uh, uh, some people just uh, uh, would, um, panic at the sight of blood or a broken bone, but we need to know how to take care of these things on our own. And our, again, our emergency communications, that's a good class to teach and alternative power sources. Those are all really good classes. And we have these classes regularly in our, uh, in, uh, and, uh, in our uh, Utah group. Um, um, we have uh, uh, meetings every month in our Utah group. And, and that's why we're doing this Zoom meeting now because we didn't want to meet personally, but uh, we would encourage you in your neighborhoods to try to gather some groups and get a, a TACTA group going so that you can meet regularly and then teach the skills to one another. But uh, as you're ending that meeting, uh, ask them of course, if they'd like to meet again and set a new date and do follow up with them. and. Uh, uh, I think it, it's a really nice tool. So are there any questions about this neighborhood plan? I'm sure you all have, have questions and concerns about that, but the lack of preparation by our friends and neighbors and extended family uh, are the, really a huge threat to our own survival. And- I think, uh, I think you did a good job with this. and. Uh, I would hope to see this basic uh, slideshow and some uh, DVDs that uh, the Tacta store could sell. And then of course you can flesh out the different subjects with other uh, uh, lectures. So it, it's certainly a step in the right direction and thank you for putting it together. Well, that's, uh, that's my pleasure. And, and I have seen it work uh, and uh, it, it's really a fun way to get to know your neighbors, to get to know one another. And um, I, I think that um, it's something that, that would be a good tool for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I work at the Emergency Management Institute at the Federal National Emergency Training Center for many years. And I remember a study of uh, coastal east, east Coast counties from Florida uh, up the Eastern seaboard. And they went to people in these coastal counties and said, you know, you're in a coastal county and these hurricanes come right up here and you could run into all kinds of problems. And they asked them about if they had a three-day emergency kit. Well, the majority did not. Some said they were thinking about making one. But the scary thing was 20% of the respondents said, well, I shouldn't have to make a kit or do that stuff because it's government's responsibility to take care of me in a disaster. <laughs> so this is the kind of mentality that, that the nation has. And as you well know, we have never, since the early days of the Cold War, had much of a, we don't have a national ethic about emergency preparedness. I mean, it's just not there. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, you know, we got to do it, like you said, at the local level with our own neighborhoods and get other people interested and we can accomplish something. Well, I, I just think it's extremely important. And I know you have all had so many experiences and, and have so much um, good information to share um, and just appreciate every one of you. It's, it's really been a pleasure working in TACTA. Um, 
always excited to hear Peter's stories. Peter always has such great stories to tell and uh, is very well is very well prepared, but I know all of you are the same. So um, we'll just keep up the best work, the best we can and keep working at it. And, and I will, I'll get this, um, this PowerPoint. Um, maybe we could keep, I don't know just how, what would be best to do with them, but um, how we could put a presentation together on a DVD, but I'm sure um, those that are more knowledgeable than I can help me do that. And, and we'll get so, some presentations. So the meeting is recorded so that anyone can watch it again or you can share it. So that's one thing we can do. And also I wanted to mention that we do have a PDF on our resources page for a neighborhood emergency plan. And it's just under the how to's section at the bottom. So you can go and download that and um, Sharon probably wrote that one too. So a lot of those ideas will be the same um, as her presentation here. So that would be a good resource for you. And also, if you uh, look at the TACTA Academy, all of these ideas are in the TACTA Academy and they are, um, there, there's just a lot of detailed information there that you could study and that if you wanted to do a neighborhood plan, you could use TACTA Academy to train your neighbors. So uh, that can be downloaded for free or you can purchase it in the store, you know, already put into a booklet form. So those are two good resources that you could get right now. And I hope that you will look over that TACTA Academy. We've written that quite a few years ago and there may be updating that you could suggest uh, I know we're working on um, the uh, communication portion of that, and we will update that. It's in process. But if there's anything else that you see that you would like to send to us that, uh, for our consideration in updating that TACT Academy, we would really appreciate it. Aaron? Yes. Hi, this is Randy. Yes, Randy. You were, you were talking a few minutes ago about individuals having personal radios or means of communication. And you probably know that in addition to Citizens Band and the family radio service, there seems to be another service that's gaining in popularity. It's called MERS, M-U-R-S. Are you familiar oh, with I, that? No, I'm, I have heard it, but I'm really not familiar well, with it multi-use, I think it's multi-use radio service. And what it does is it makes available a number of frequencies lower than UHF or family radio service. These are in about, I believe the 151 or 154 megahertz range. So it's just another service that's out there. Uh, does um, it require a, um, does it require a, um, um, like a license? No, um, a relay station. Negative. Um, actually, when I was studying for my amateur radio license, um, I was using uh, a Baofeng HD radio on MERS, and I have those frequencies right here in front of me if you'd like me to, to give those off. Okay. Uh, the first one is 154.600. The next one, 156.880. The next one is 154.570. Next, 151.940. And the last one, when you're ready, 151.880. Two zero. Great. I do have uh, a piece of information on the 156.880. Uh, make sure you're well in land when you use that because that is a marine band. Make sure okay. you're away from the coastline. But it is a, a, a simplex or line of sight uh, uh, frequency. And um, you're supposed to operate it at like one watt or maybe less, but everybody mm -hmm. runs it five, eight, whatever they can get their hands on, but it, 
just just so you know, that's uh, available for use until you get your amateur radio license. Oh, wonderful. That's good news. That's cool. Peter? I may be mistaken, but there's a company called Midland. Probably most of you have heard of it. They're probably most best known for their citizen band equipment. But I've, if I'm not mistaken, not too long ago, Midland announced the release of some MERS radios that were mobile units. And I believe that they're putting out somewhere in the area of 15 watts. I may be mistaken, and you're right about limitations on power output on some of those frequencies, but that would considerably extend the range of these MERS radios if they were used as mobile communications devices. And so what, what meter range is that? I, I know the 40 to 80 meter range, we don't need a relay station, but the two meter range we do. What range are we talking about? You mean as far as distance that, that uh, they no, will... uh, 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 the um, the radio what band? They... What band is it in? Is what she's well, asking. Well, it's going to be close to two meters, Peter okay. and yeah. Sharon, okay. because as you know, one two meters is one forty four to one forty eight. These are one fifty four, so they're really closer to public service or what used to be the old public service bands. Okay, and so line of sight, of course, we wouldn't need a relay station, but but uh, I would think anything that isn't line of sight, then they would require a relay station, which is vulnerable in an EMP, as what I was asking, why I was asking, because an EMP probably would take out our relay stations um, uh, uh, after once their generator ability is gone. But, uh, but they certainly, I mean, there's certainly more than a enough emergencies to justify that that aren't EMP. There's also a, a band that's been not brought up yet. It's GMRS. Um, and they do make repeaters for that. And you do not, they do not require a license for that. Um, I don't know how much the repeaters cost. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. I don't think GMRS requires a license. It may. It may require an FCC license that you don't have to study for. You just have to buy it. Um, I could be wrong on that one. It does require a license. You purchase it right now, and at some point shortly in the future, they're going to lower the cost of that. Uh, I just put up a repeater. It's you know it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, and uh, if I if I know an EMP is coming, I'll take it down and put it back up later. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, you have some spare parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you know. And that could be run on solar as well, you know, as, as backup power. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Well, and and uh, uh, I know and that, that's GMRS is also if you purchase the license. Um, I, I just had to renew mine. I forget if it's seventy five dollars or what. Good for ten years, and the whole family, parents, grandparents, kids, grandkids, aunts, uncles, everybody can use that call sign. Wonderful. Comment for fellow amateur radio operators, just remember that an EMP or a solar storm will destroy our equipment unless it's protected. Yeah, and that's certainly something we should talk about, John. I think that's really important. Um, the solar storm is more like a DC current, uh, EMP, the E1, E2, E3, uh, the E3 portion of EMP is very much like a solar storm, like the solar coronal uh, so mass ejection, but but um, uh, that would take uh, affects our transformers, but the solar doesn't particularly affect our equipment, just the use of the equipment. But uh, the EMP, of course, would affect our equipment as well. But those are we we really need to look at encouraging our folks to keep all of their equipment in a Faraday cage, and they can be made fairly simply with steel garbage cans and things like that. But um, uh, I always kept mine in a garbage can. And then when I wanted to use my ham radio, I just took it out and then immediately wrapped it and put it back in the, the Faraday cage. But it is something that we really need to press on because people don't understand that. Aaron, I had one, one other question. Excuse me. 
Go ahead. I was oh, just going to say that it's a very inexpensive Faraday cage. If you go to your hardware store and Ace Hardware carries them, they have paint cans that are just paint cans. And so you can put your telephone in that. And there's also a product called Reflectix, R-E-F-L-E-C-T-I-X. And it comes in rolls uh, out of Indiana, the factory in Indiana. And so if you line your basement with that, you're effectively creating Faraday cage in the basement. So those are just two options. Cool. Anybody going to know microwave? It doesn't work anymore. Yeah, cut off the cord. Good job, Frank. Yeah, and just stick your stuff inside of it. Yeah, but make sure that it doesn't have a cord still, so you're right. not tempted to plug it in. <laughs> right. Buy your equipment. That really is. That does make a great. Well, and and then we need to remember too that we don't have a lot of our equipment doesn't require a perfect Faraday cage. We're just uh, designing a shelter right now. I'm still designing concrete shelters. And uh, we have to have a verification path around our EMP protected areas so that they can have perfect verification. And this is for most basically calm rooms. But uh, uh, if we get a good portion of that EMP, uh, we're going to really limit the damage. So it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a, the, uh, the huge uh, with the huge filters and all the expensive things, we can do this really quite effectively with with a metal lined area, uh, things like like the garbage cans and like the paint cans. Those are good suggestions. Appreciate it. Sharon? Yes, Randy. With regard to the individual radios that we were talking about a little bit earlier or those used by i don't know maybe a neighborhood watch commander or um, manager had has there been any talk about designating certain frequencies so that people know if they have gmrs or frs or mers or whatever they have it seems to me that not long ago, there was some kind of a drive to, to designate channel three on, and maybe one of you can help me out with this. Channel three is a standard emergency go-to channel or frequency. At any rate, if they're gonna get the equipment in order for there to be interoperability, then it might be good to be thinking also in terms of specific channels or frequencies that people know they can tune to. Absolutely. So we, uh, and those old CVs, I mean, those were good radios and we had a lot of uh, options with those old CVs. I, I encourage people to get the CVs in our neighborhood. But, uh, uh, Randy, you've been so helpful to us. I really appreciate that. He's, he's writing and, and upgrading all of our uh, TACTA uh, uh, information on communications. So we really appreciate all the help all of you give us. I believe Am, Amron, I believe it is, uh, was recommended Channel 3 to everybody. Uh, channel 3 on GMRS, Channel 3 on FRS, Channel 3 on CB. Uh, as as an emergency uh channel just a standard so we'll thanks, for, thanks frank that sounds exactly right i'd forgotten about amron mm -hmm. so uh will we be talking over people and uh, would that be uh, only used for emergencies or could we maybe get a channel that would just be kind of inter neighborhood type that we could use i wonder well i think the extent to which you could get people to understand that whatever channel or frequency is selected is to be used only for emergency communications. And there's all the other frequencies and channels that are available for chit chat or socializing or whatever. Right. It's sort of like the channel 19 deal with CB years ago. Everybody understood that was largely for truckers. Uh -huh. So that if we, designated certain channels or frequencies within these different radio services for emergency communications, then maybe people would get the idea that unless it is an emergency communication, they need to use a different frequency That's or channel. True. 
Uh, yeah, and that's so important. And and then the other thing, you know, if our if our power is limited, we don't want to be sitting and monitoring that continually. So we probably ought to designate with our own neighborhoods. Uh, if you have an emergency, you know, uh, there may not be someone monitoring. So we will be monitoring during this hour or during these hours, so that uh, uh, they have a time that they can check in. Well, the good news is though. Um is that when you're monitoring, that, that doesn't bleed much energy off of you. That's right. It's it listening. Not just transmitting. That's right. Yes. The other thing, though, is um, it's not so much clearing a channel entirely for the whole time. It's having net controllers who can take control of that of that band or that uh, frequency uh, saying, hey, this is a, uh, an emergency net, um, whatever the group is, and they need recognition from some entity that says, you know, if you're a CB or I don't care if this is an open rag chew, you stop what you're doing. Um, this is an emergency net. Uh, uh, any emergency traffic come now and maybe they tell what the uh, uh, emergency is, you know, and for the range that they're looking for uh, people to, to report in. Uh -huh. uh, that's good. Now, uh, are you suggesting that there be net controllers for your uh, particular area? I mean, if we're line of sight, then uh, we're not going to be doing a big ham net control, um, but maybe we could designate some people within our our neighborhoods to kind of control a, a line of sight area. Sure, um, it, you know, and you could also, you know, we do the simplex net every Sunday night, uh, uh, and I'm very active with that one. Um, and we get check-ins from simplex line of sight from we've had them from Dumas, Arkansas before. Um, so you'd be surprised what simplex can do uh, with the right antenna. Mm -hmm. So you may, you never know what you might get. Uh-huh. Sure. Well, that communications is so important. We've got to know what's happening and, uh, uh, how long it's going to last and, and if what dangers are specific to what areas and, uh, it, it's just, uh, really, really important. So Roseanne, how are we doing? Are we through with our hour? Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, it's about 6.55, so. Okay. Unless Wonderful. anybody has any other questions or comments. Well, we'd really appreciate okay. having everyone come and hopefully we can do this again next month. And I'm not sure who's going to do it. Who, who will do it next month, Roseanne? Um, I'm not sure yet, but it'll, it should be the second Saturday. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe we could get more people if we did it on a Thursday. Does anybody um, have any feelings about that? You think it's better on Saturdays or would you have more time to do it if we did it during the week? I feel like a lot of people have a lot going on in the weekend. I think maybe during the week might be better because a lot of people go out for dinner on Saturdays and things like that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, um, Maybe we should do it on a Thursday night and we probably get get more people available. Well, and of course, our Civil Defense Volunteers of Utah is still meeting on uh, or has been meeting on the Saturday. I don't know if that would be a. a we'll have to talk with them and see if, if how they feel about changing to Thursday. I just yeah. feel like uh, a, a lot of people do have plans on the weekend and it might be uh -huh. easier. Well, that might be a better night. Go clear to Salt Lake. Sometimes it's better to go on a weekend, but now that we're doing it Zoom, it yeah. might be a good way to do it. So I will Saturday, call the Civil Defense Volunteers and just see what would work better for people. Okay. And so, uh, Jonathan, uh, I know you've done so many of these lessons and classes, and I've had feedback on them. How, what a wonderful job you're doing, uh, both of you, and I really appreciate all you've done. Um, oh. And we, we can get with the uh, with. Jay Wimpy also and see what he wants us to do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And it's it's all a team effort. We're trying to get as many people up to speed as we can. So well, and and you ought to all uh, uh, real uh, to recognize Jonathan at their their uh, their website. Um, tell me what it's called again, Jonathan. I have it on my providentprepper.org. Prepper, uh huh. And just uh, no end to the good information that they they have uh, uh, given to us. And, and so we really appreciate all your efforts, all of you. You're very kind, thank you. 
And Sharon, a lot of people are wondering if they can get a copy of your presentation. Do you think we could um, get that on the website or I can email it? Sure. Uh huh. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, great. And I'll look over that, uh, uh, that neighborhood plan and make sure that it's kind of up to date with the things we've talked about. All right. Well, I'll turn it over to you, Rosanne. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's great. We had such it's been a great a pleasure time. Meet, it's been a pleasure meeting each of you and talking with you. Take care. Yeah, this Thank, is you. Good. Thank you. Thank all. you all. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks, Sharon. Uh-huh. You're welcome. Thanks, Roseanne. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, Peter. Ah. Yeah. Oh, I gotta see her. <laughs> Hi, darling. I've heard about you since before you were born. <laughs> oh, this is uh, that's that's Miss Miss Packer. That's Sharon Packer. I can see if I can get the video up of her. No. Nope. Uh, well, this is Hannah. Hi, Hannah. And Hi, Evelyn. Hannah. This is Hannah. I mean, Evelyn. I'm sorry. Hi, Hi Evelyn. Hannah too. We know that you've been preparing well. We've heard about you for a long time. Mm -hmm. you've, and uh, you've been up to the shelter, haven't you? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. No, you haven't been there yet, Evie. We got to get you up there. And that's Christina, my wife. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> it's nice to see you guys. Um, I'm going to eat some dinner and, uh, and uh, be with my family for a while. Okay. Good. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Thanks. Good to see you guys. Randy, yeah. I hope your wife is doing better. It, I'm, Randy may be gone, but it, I know that uh, we've all had a lot of challenges. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks. Everyone, have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye.